What's up, Eagles fans? Welcome in to Birds 365. Obviously, I'm not Jody Mack. Bill Calarulo filling in for Jody today. Another day for us to realize the season is over. But we have not heard from our man John McMullen yet, who had a long journey back from Tampa Bay. So it's going to be good to hear from Johnny Mack. What's going on, Johnny? Uh, uh, yeah, it's great to be, well, it's not great to be back. Cause I was telling you guys before we got on, I had to stop over in Fort Lauderdale where it was a, a balmy 83 degrees. And then I'm back here and I'm chipping an inch of ice off the car. So, um, could be better from that perspective. Could be better from the Eagles perspective, but yeah, clean out day today, uh, at down at the Novacare complex. That'll be this afternoon. Exit interviews, Nick Sirianni talking to the players, the coaches. And then ultimately later in the week, he'll have his through the ringer meeting with Jeffrey Laurie, Howry Roseman, that kind of stuff. And we'll get a clearer picture on what's going to go on with this team in the offseason. But clearly, even in the best of times, as you saw last season, Bill significant turnover on every NFL roster. That's just the way the modern NFL works. Uh, but you do get the sense there's going to be more than normal in Philadelphia, both the coaching staff and 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 uh, the personnel part of it. And we'll see how it all lands. But uh, I get a Doug Peterson vibe, I'll tell you that. And by that, I mean, I, I think Jeffrey Lurie, as he goes into his meetings with Nick Sirianni, will go in with the idea that he's going to be back. Uh, but there are going to be clearly stated issues that have to be changed. And if, if, if Jeffrey doesn't like Nick's plans for those issues, then things can go off the rails. But uh, it's going to take a little bit of time for people expecting, oh, he's going to get fired today. Anything's possible. He can go in there and say, F you, Jeff, and he's fired. But I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, it doesn't seem like Jeffrey Lurie to make a real rash decision very quickly. Probably will take some time. But will we hear from Jeffrey Lurie at all this week, or does he usually not speak this week? No, he's he's not going to speak unless something major happens, unless, obviously, the head coach is, is released or – the GM, nobody talks about Howie, but he's got a big piece of this pie as well. Uh, but understandably so, people think he's safe. I think he's safe. I'm not trying to say he isn't. But again, we're talking about one guy, really, and, and Jeffrey Lurie. So everybody's trying to decipher what Jeffrey's going to do with this franchise. He has shifted in the past. He shifted you know, from Andy Reid to Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly kind of broke him in the fact that he no longer wanted to coach with, uh, you know, sort of personnel power and took it back to the more traditional GM coach mindset. And who knows, maybe this breaks him and he goes back in the other direction. At the end of the day, you're talking about one guy. And for those people saying, well, he'll never fire Howie. He did once. He didn't fire him, but he demoted him. He shone the side him, put him on the other side of the building, albeit with a raise. But he had no power from a personnel perspective. Uh, he moved on from Joe Banner, who was his closest competent years and years ago. And he ultimately fired Andy Reid because he knows there's a shelf life for everybody in the NFL. And by no means. I mean, to this day, uh, Jeffrey Lurie will tell you, you know, what Andy Reid meant to this franchise and this organization and obviously where he is in the the pantheon of NFL coaches. I mean, Jeffrey knows how good he is, but you saw it this year with Bill Belichick. It might be a quarter century, Bill, but everybody's got a shelf life. Everybody. What they say, the NFL stands for not for long, right? That's what everybody says. So I want to talk to you more about the overall picture and the players and the coaching staff. But before we do, we haven't had a chance to talk about the game. Oh, an dang. embarrassing performance. Let's start on the defensive side of the football. Did it surprise you to see a team that really looked like it lacked effort, aggression, and inability to tackle? For me, I know they lack personnel. But it looked as if these guys weren't even given effort out there. What did you see from the defense? Yeah, that's the biggest concern for me because you start asking questions about, you know, tackling. There's technique involved. There's fundamentals involved. But 
a lot of it is effort, as you mentioned. And that was a performance. Like, I, I went into that game very comfortable. Did a number of spots here on, on Jacob Sports around the country. Playoff game gets ramped up. I, I was very comfortable saying Nick Sirianni was going to be back as the head coach. Um, I couldn't envision this type of performance. I just couldn't even, you know, I, I, I they might lose the game. But it, it'll be relatively close. They'll be in it in the fourth quarter. Um, it was a disaster. Uh, but on both sides of the football, but particularly defensively because of the tackling issues. And I asked Nick about that after the game. And he's right from the standpoint he's been saying it for a couple of weeks. Um, for most of the season, they were top five by most advanced metrics when it came to tackling now it's kind of a lost art in the nfl the modern nfl compared to what it used to be so that part of it's a little bit baked in but compared to everybody else they were pretty good at it and then down the stretch everybody just said ah, i'm done i'm done tackling what what's the reason for that bill is it because they're upset about the move from Sean Desai to Matt Patricia is they're upset at the head coach. They're not given the effort. That's the kind of thing that can cost the coach's job more than um, a loss, even an ugly loss. If, if people perceive and if the owner and the GM perceive, well, these are, these guys just aren't playing for them for whatever reason, that, that could be what gets the pull the plug faster than just about anything else. And that was the biggest concern for me coming out of that game. Just it certainly looked to the naked eye a lack of effort. It really did. And I rarely say that about NFL players because I don't think that's my place. I think everybody's comfortable saying, oh, this guy isn't trying. I see these guys every day. They work pretty stinking hard to show up on game day to embarrass themselves. So I got to go a long way before I say somebody's lacking effort. Um, but it looked bad. I will say that. It looked bad in Tampa. Yeah, it did look bad. And it looked bad on the defensive side of the football, but it didn't look any better on the offensive side. And when you look at the offense, I know a lot of fans were frustrated. I was frustrated. Going into that game, we all thought the game plan should be try to establish the run. Try to win the time of possession battle. You're missing your number one wide receiver in A.J. Brown. You have a quarterback who has a dislocated finger on his throwing hand, okay, this is going to be the game. They ran for 200 yards in week three. This will be the game. They really lean on the offensive line and the run. They ran it five times and threw it 21 times in the first half. What the hell happened? Well, you know, I, I think it's interesting. I'll, I'll, an ode to my my tip, my tip, usual part, partner, Jody Mack, that starts at the coin toss, you know. But I, I'm not going to kill the Eagles – uh, for deferring. They win the co coin toss and defer. Now, every, everybody's going to point to the Green Bay game and say, look at Green Bay. Well, Green Bay is in a situation where they're playing a heavily favored team at home who had scored, you know, historic numbers on their home field. So they came into that game saying, we got to run the football with Aaron Jones. We got to shorten the clock. We got to shorten the game against an explosive offense. And they played even better than that. They just blew Dallas off the field. But that was the mindset of Matt, Matt LaFleur when he wins the toss and takes the football. In the Eagles' perspective, they're like, well, you know, Tampa Bay is not very explosive. Um, so they, they stayed true to the normal way of thinking around the NFL. You want to defer. You want the ball in the second half. You want to try to sandwich the first half and second half with scores. And, of course, it doesn't work because the defense is horrible. They did eventually hold uh, Tampa to a field goal on that first drive. And then they get the ball, and they start with two runs, and they're pretty successful. Well, the first run of the game was for nine yards, but they get a first down. And then comes the short pass to Julio Jones, short pass to Dallas Goddard. Your third and, and, and two, very manageable. Should be simple, incomplete pass down the field to Dallas Goddard. Just very strange, very disconnected, very bad situational football. Um, and then you're off and running in the game. 
And the Eagles, again, the defense is so bad, they can't do anything against Tampa Bay, which I think people are going to see. If they if they haven't checked out on the season, uh, I think people are going to see um, Detroit pretty much handle business pretty easily against Tampa Bay. Um, not Not a tremendous football team. And I think it took them four plays to score on a 44-yard touchdown. Um, yeah. Uh, and then you're behind the eight ball, and it becomes, can you be disciplined enough to stick with the running game? And the answer was no. And I, I don't know if the answer shouldn't have been no because Tampa Bay scored – on their first four possessions. And remember, the only reason it wasn't a complete blowout at that point was they dropped six passes. Yeah. I counted seven, but they were credited for six by halftime, Bill. And that was the most drop passes in a postseason game. Game, not a half, game in 17 years. Wow. And they were still dominating. And they should have been up by three touchdowns by that point. That's how bad the defense was. And it wasn't just this game that this defense has been bad. I mean, really, this defense has been bad all year, but they've been really bad since they made the move to Matt Patricia a few <laughs> games ago. And we've talked about that. I think Jody and I spoke about it yesterday on the show. Who do you think made that decision to change defensive coordinators with <laughs> still four games left in the season? Was that Sirianni? Was that Howie Roseman? Well, I'll say this. I mean, I, I've said it pretty consistently. It, it, I think it was Nick's decision um, for a lot of reasons. Some I can't talk about. Um, some I can. But um, I'll, I'll say this. For the people that don't think it was Nick's um, decision, which is possible, um, I think it's unlikely but possible, then he shouldn't even. you shouldn't even been thinking about firing the guy. This this that's his biggest spiral offense. If you want him out of town, that that's it. Forget about the offense. Forget about the blitz pickups. Forget about all that stuff. If you want the guy out of town, and I'm not advocating they should fire him, but if the people and there's so many people that do, you should be pointing to that decision because that decision was an absolute disaster, and it and it came when they were wh where it started where it started was at the bye week when they were eating one why are you even thinking about making a change when you're eating one number one and then the second part is they took away third down autonomy from um sean desai for the dallas game the week before they fired uh demoted him not fired him um and they've gotten progressively worse against lesser competition. I think, and this is what I said when they made the move, look, it's pretty clear they didn't have competence in Sean Desai. So if that's the case, that's the case. But then you should get the guy out of the building. Keeping him around isn't a good look either. But if you don't have competence in him, I can see the thought process because that's what I had. I said, you know, the Eagles defense is going to get better over the final month of the season because of the schedule. It was, it was due to the schedule. You were playing lesser competition. You weren't playing Buffalo, San Francisco, and Dallas any longer. You're playing the Giants and the Cardinals. Somehow it got worse. So my thought is, my thought is that Nick said, you know what, if I make it here, the defense will gather some confidence against some poor opponents and maybe we'll be ready to play at least serviceably in the playoffs. That's what I think the plan was. It got worse. Somehow it got worse. Yeah, which I is unbelievable. When, when they made the move, I tweeted out saying, Eagles fans, relax over the next few weeks thinking that Matt Patricia is the next coming of Jim Johnson. Look at who they're going to play. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it didn't, didn't work out at all. But Let's jump over real quickly back to the offense, though, because as bad as the defense has been, the one thing we've seen with this offense is an inability to have a plan for the blitz. Now, 
Two weeks in a row, you had Wink Martindale in week 18 with the Giants. You knew he was going to blitz the hell out of Jalen Hurts. And now in this wild card matchup with Todd Bowles, you knew he was going to blitz Jalen Hurts. And it just didn't seem that there was a plan for the blitz. And then you look at their third down conversions, 0 for 9 in that game, John, which was 0 for I've 11 if you want to add uh, fourth, fourth down. down. In. Yeah. So oh, what did oh, you see? Left. Was there no plan for the blitz? Do you put that on the coaching staff or do you put that on Jalen Hurts? Um, I put it on everything a little bit, uh, certainly a little bit coaching staff, certainly a little bit scheme, certainly a little bit Jalen Hurts. Now, here's where I'm going to get in trouble for the first time of many in the upcoming weeks. If you ask me who's most responsible, I'm going to say Jalen Hurts. Um it sure doesn't look like, you know, when you talk, for instance, you know, everybody's obsessed with hot, hot routes, uh, site adjustments, which is basically where the quarterback's got to get on the same page as the, the wide receivers. Well, think about site adjustment. Think what that means. You got to see it and you got to adjust. If you don't see it and if you don't adjust and if it's in the offense, if it's in the game plan, well, whose fault is that? So. A, if you want to blame it on the coaching staff, stop talking about hot routes, number one. Number two, which is basically a high school concept and everything, you can go watch your local high school game. It ain't hard to put in an NFL offense. So that part of the criticism is ludicrous. Um, You know, it's interesting if you go back to the Seattle game, for instance. Think about the situation of that game. There's be and we now know because he, AJ Brown is confirmed. He he called it and 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 it probably got it probably got reported a little bit poorly in certain circles because of the word uh, um, AJ used and uh, it, it it basically was a check at the line of scrimmage, and AJ called it. Well, I forget he didn't say freelancing, but he used. Um, yeah, I'm forgetting the word now, too. Yeah, I'll look it up in the break. But uh, he basically said they were freelancing. They weren't. They were making a normal check. And if they execute it properly, who knows? Maybe they win the game and it's not that big of an issue. Uh, but they didn't. And Nick um, protected the players with a pretty goofy explanation um, and came across looking pretty poorly which showed his loyalty to the players and his willingness to protect the players. AJ stepped up. Jalen didn't when it took to accountability. Let's be honest. He he could have done it. He could have said, you know what? My, my coach is looking pretty bad right now. Um, I could step up here and explain that that was on me. He didn't do it. Um, is there a disconnect between Jalen Hurts and Nick Sirianni? Because that, you know, in that battle, if there is a battle, well, the quarterback's going to win. Yeah. The quarterback's going to be here. And if he doesn't want the coach here, then Nick's, is, Nick's in trouble. But it's interesting to me, he doesn't go out of his way, and he did it again after the game in Tampa when he was asked about if Nick's going to be back, and he sort of salt-pedaled it. And um, But that's Jalen. He's always that way. So I can't tell you if it's purposeful um, or it's just him doing his normal flatline type of presence, which has got him to the point where he is. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's what threw me off, too. I felt like Jalen had a few opportunities over the last few weeks to put his support behind Sirianni, and he hasn't done it. And when he was asked about what A.J. Brown said, that Nick Sirianni took the blame for you guys. Well, he said, there's a lot you guys don't know. In fact, you don't know what you don't know. And instead of saying, yeah, Sirianni does have our back, and I, I ride with Sirianni, or whatever words he wanted to use, but I agree with you. But we got a lot more to talk about. We'll talk about this coaching staff more and a lot of personnel decisions. We're going to be joined, like we are every week, by Mike Gill from 97.3 Sports Bash after the break. So stay tuned, Birds fans. Hit that like button for us. We'll be right back. 